No audio. You, you have no audio. Okay, can anybody hear me now? Testing one, two, testing one, two, three, four, testing one, two. Yes, I can hear you. Hear you now. Okay. Okay, well let's uh let's move on then and uh go back here and get my document. Folks, this has been this has been amazing. Uh, you've you've indicated uh, on Facebook this morning that I've been having trouble uh, with all of this, and let me tell you where I believe that, where I believe the problem is. This was a microphone problem, and the microphone was working about eight thirty, about uh, about seven o'clock this morning. I've been up since early testing this to make sure it was working, and then all of a sudden it doesn't work again, but. Uh, I have an idea of what's causing all this, and uh, but I'm not going to not going to talk about that right now. Just going to go ahead and get into the, into the message as long as you as long as you can hear me. Uh, let's take just a moment of time to pray, though. Okay, 
Father, uh, whatever's happening here with the, with the volume, the way that it's been fluctuating in and out, uh, the, the, the sound system here, uh, inside the studio, inside the house, testing all this. It works here, it works there, and then all of a sudden it doesn't work at all. This is not, this is not necessarily a pilot error, but it, it's, it's what is going on uh, in the world today. Uh, it, and I'm not blaming anything else, but it just, it's obvious that there's something happening here uh, that uh, we need to consider. So anyway, we're going to move on from here, Father, because I think the message this morning is important to us. And so we lift it up to you and ask you to, uh, to, uh, uh, to glorify yourself, to, um, uh, to honor and bless us uh, who are your children. And I pray this in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Okay, let's move on from here. I uh, was looking at something day before yesterday. And I want you to, to listen to what I have to say here. According to the internet, and by that, that, that there's, a, there's a, a situation out here where someone has written about this, and it using the word creaster. That word is pronounced creaster. And I'm going to ask you, do you understand and do you know what a creaster is? But I saw a post on Facebook this morning that it was exactly what I'm talking about here. According to the internet, a priester is one who attends church, quote unquote, twice a year on Christmas and on Easter. That is a priester. Now, here's the viewpoint of one religious writer on the internet. This tradition of going to church on the holidays means that you, that is the traditional church out here, that you will have new guests and families coming through the doors of your church this Easter. That's today. It is, it is crucial, and this is the opinion of the religious people, it is crucial that you see this time for its potential to bring people to Christ and change lives through your Easter sermon. Don't just bring out the same sermon you've been preaching since before Al Gore inter invented the internet. Now that Al Gore deal, that's tongue in cheek because he did not invent the internet even though he thinks he did. This is the challenge then of the season for every pastor. I would have, I would have, um, uh, I would take uh, take exceptions to that st that sentence. This is the challenge of the season for every pastor. What is the challenge to find an Easter sermon, a Christian sermon that you've been preaching for fifty years or whatever, and trying to make it new? So when you're dealing with some of the most familiar Bible st uh, Bible stories. For a pastor, it is a struggle to teach and present them in a new and exciting way. Well, the truth of the matter is, is that I don't fit that mold. And I, I understand what this guy is saying here, but this is not what it's all about. You don't come to, you don't come to, uh, to a, an assembly uh, just to be evangelized on uh, Easter and Christmas. Uh, you, you don't do that. That's not what it's all about. You evangelize in the street. You evangelize in the public square. You evangelize wherever you go. It's the pastor's responsibility to teach the word of God so that when the people who are coming to listen to the message are able to go out into the public square as mature believers giving answers to the questions that are being raised out there and to evangelize the lost. This is our responsibility. You go to the people who need to be saved. You're not waiting for them to come to the come to the church. And the truth of the matter is, is even on Easter and Christmas at this point in time, with the attitude of the people across our country about the word of God, you're going to find few unbelievers coming to church on Sunday morning. So the pastor is evangelizing the saved. That's not the issue. The pastor teacher's responsibility is to teach the word of God through the ICE method, isagogically, categorically, exegetically, to make certain that he is teaching the truth and not some myth. Now, it's rather interesting, and I'm going to share some information with you, not, not right now, but in uh, sometime maybe this afternoon, I'll just go out on Facebook and, and publish this. But it's an amazing thing when you hear what people understand and think about Christmas, Easter, the holidays, what's going on in the country. It's people are oblivious to what is taking place in our country and the world today. So with that, with that in mind, I'm going to turn my attention to the concept of the resurrection. 
And I'm not sure how long this will take. We may finish early. We may may have some stuff left over here before the uh, before the uh, uh, at the time the message ends. But we're going to go with what we have here. Let's talk about bibl biblical evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We live in a time when many many people, multitudes of people, don't believe in Jesus. They, they're out there worshiping some other, some other god, some other entity, a totem pole, the fish, the mountain, whatever. But, and they have no, no concept of Jesus Christ or the resurrection. Now, with that in mind, we need to make sure that when we go out into the public square and we're talking to people about the word of God, we need to make sure that if we're confronted with people who don't understand the resurrection, that we're able to give them biblical evidence. So in John 11, 25 and 26, the scripture says, Jesus was speaking to Martha. And here's what he told Martha. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, Jesus, not somebody else, he who believes in me will live even if he dies. Now stop and think about that. How do you live if you die? Well, what he's talking about is the resurrection. He is the resurrection. And while we, uh, I was thinking uh, last night about this in, in the sense that uh, what this gentleman said who posted that note up there that I gave you at the beginning of the, uh, the, the session here, about finding a new sermon, finding a new sermon, because you've been preaching this for long. Listen, I have, I have actually been on this planet 85 Easter's, and I can't tell you exactly how many, how many Easter messages I've heard, Easter sermons that I've heard, messages regarding the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but it is more than just a few. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life, he who believes in me, even if he, if he will live, he who believes in me will live even if he dies. Now, that third class condition there of that word if, stop and think about that for a minute. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And that third class condition means maybe you will and maybe you won't. Now, let me ask you a question. Here it is, Jesus is the resurrection. We know that he came out of the grave three days after he was crucified. Now he says here, if you believe in me, you will live even if you, even if you die. So okay, death is not the end of the line. And many people fear that death is the end of the line. And guess what? They want to live, they wanna, they wanna extend their life no matter how bad life is. Well, Jesus said, if you believe in me, you're going to live even if you die. You know what he was talking about there? If you believe in Jesus, there will be a resurrection in your life. So that when you go to the grave, when you go to the grave, that's not the end of it. As a matter of fact, your spirit and soul are already in heaven. And there's going to come a time when you personally, you will be resurrected. Your, your body will come out of the grave or wherever it lays, whether it's in the sea, in the ground, in a tomb somewhere, you're coming out of there and you will have a resurrection body. And guess what? You will be united with your spirit and soul and you are going to live forever. Even if you die because you have believed in him, you're going to live beyond the grave. Then in verse 26, he says, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Now, that, what is that? What is he talking about that? If you, if you believe in him, you will never die. Well, you're, well, unless the rapture occurs, you're going to die. What does he mean? He's talking here about eternity. Once you have your resurrection body, see the context here is resurrection. So what we're going to find out later on is that we have a wonderful, wonderful hope, confidence that once we are saved, we we die physically, we are resurrected at a certain point in time after our death, and once we get into eternity future, there will never be a time when that happens again. And we find many, many people who over the years of my ministry have asked me, well, once we get, once we get past the end of human history and we get into this new, new earth and this uh, new heaven, uh, what would happen if it ever happens again? So in human history, God created Adam, he created Eve, 
They were in perfect environment. They were perfect people. They were righteous people. And bingo, what happened? Satan tested, tempted them, and bingo, down they go. Unrighteous. They passed that unrighteousness, unrighteousness on to you and me. So the mind in operation overthink says, mm-hmm. Uh, I know I don't know much doctrine. I know I don't know much about the Bible. But what happens if after we get into eternity future with that new heaven and the new earth, what happens if it happens all over again? Jesus said, everyone who lives and believes in me will never die, period. There's your answer. And that's with reference to the um, uh, eternity. And Jesus turned to Martha after he's talking about this and he focuses on it and said, do you believe this? Martha, do you believe this? I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will, will live even if he dies. You too, Martha, you're going to live even if you die. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And that's out there in the future. So I ask you the same question that Jesus asked Martha. Do you believe this? Well, if you do, what you know is that when you die physically, that is not the end of life. There is going to come a time when you too will receive a resurrection body. And after you receive that resurrection body, you have, you have complete confidence in God that it will never happen again. <clears throat> well, in Mark 16, 6, Jesus is speaking here. And it says, and he, well, actually, he says, and he, a young man sitting in the tomb, said to them, well, it's not Jesus speaking, but Marcus can, uh, is writing about this situation. And here's what happened. Here's a young man sitting at the tomb. And he said to them, that's Mary Magdalene, Mary, Mary the mother of James, and Salome. These three ladies come to the tomb. And this young man sitting there at the tomb looked up at them and says, do not be amazed. Why? Why not be amazed? I mean, what's going on here? Jesus has already been resurrected. The, the tomb, the, the boulder in front of the tomb has been removed. He's out of there. So he said, don't be amazed. You're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who, was, who has been crucified. Well, that was three days prior to this. And here's what that young man sitting at the tomb said. He has risen. Now, what are we doing here? Look back up here. We're looking for biblical evidence of the ev uh, biblical evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you believe the word of God, we have to believe that he has, he has risen. He's been resurrected. He's no longer in that tomb. And that's what this young man is telling uh, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and, uh, and Salome. He says, he has risen. Guess what? If he's risen, he is not here. Behold, here, this tomb right here, here is the place where they laid him, but guess what? He's gone. He has been resurrected. Well, Luke says in 24, uh, 24 verse uh, 6, he said, he is not here, but he is risen. Remember, remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee? What did he say? Saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, uh-oh, and the third day rise again. Do you understand that when we're, when we're going through the book of Acts, and as we, were, uh, as we were teaching through the book of Ephesians, teaching through the book of Romans, we have seen time and time and time again, these are Jews that are being spoken to here. These are men, these are women, who should have understood exactly what was happening here. But you know what? They didn't understand. They didn't understand the crucifixion. They didn't understand the resurrection. They didn't understand the Messiah when he came. They knew there would be a Messiah, but they didn't understand all this. And this is one of the reasons why Jesus indicated to the disciples, listen, I'd like to tell you a whole lot more before I go away. There's a whole lot more that I need to tell you. And basically what he could have told them is exactly what Paul is telling us today. But he couldn't do that. Why? Because these disciples, the disciples of Jesus, following him for three years, did not understand the concept of resurrection. So he had to withhold that information and said, okay, you'll have to get that later on. And that would be after he is, he is crucified, dead, and buried, and three days later come out of the grave. Oh, that's what he was talking about. Now I see, now I can understand those things that he wanted to tell us, but wasn't able to do so.
Now we're talking about biblical evidence of the resurrection. Now this, at this point, what we're doing is we're focusing on Jesus Christ himself. But later, what we're going to do in this message is take this resurrection of Jesus and bring it to bear on your life and mine as a born again Christian and show us the value of his resurrection to you and me. Not only is there value to him, he came out of the grave, he lives forever, but there's applications to you and me. And that's why we come to Bible class. We come to Bible class not to be evangelized because you're already saved and you can only be saved one time. So let's move on to Matthew 20, uh, Matthew 20, verse 18. He said, behold, we, now this is Jesus and the disciples. This is we, he's traveling with them. He said, we're going up to Jerusalem and the son of man, that's Jesus. He's talking about himself. He said, and the son of man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes. That's not good. That's not good, but it's all part of God's plan. And they, what are they going to do? When he's delivered to the chief priests and the scribes, they will condemn him to death and, and will hand him over in verse 19. And once they condemn him to death, uh, let's see, we're in a courtroom now, you are guilty. So what do they do? They pronounced him guilty and handed him over to the Gentiles. Why did they do that? and will hand him over to the Gentiles to mock and scourge and crucify him. i tell you what, I don't know whether you saw it the other day, and the, uh, the Passion has been on TV, that movie has been on TV. Quite honestly, folks, I don't need to, to watch that. I, 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 I see that kind of a concept, and when you see what they did to Jesus in the movies, now, the movie is, is a pretty good depiction of what actually happened to him in life. But the man that actually played Jesus in, the, in some of those movies was on telev television the other night and was being interviewed. And he indicated that the, that the toughest part of what he was doing was when he was walking with that cross on his shoulder, bearing that cross, he actually dislocated his shoulder. And what he did is he, he said he took his arm, that arm with a dislocated shoulder, and wrapped that thing around, the, around that heavy cross and bore that thing to the spot where he was going to be crucified. And in other words, the, the issue was he, he wasn't really, he, he didn't have his hands and his feet nailed to the cross, but in sensing some of the pain that Jesus might have gone through with that dislocated shoulder. He didn't stop, throw that thing down and say, ow, my shoulder hurts. Somebody's going to have to take over. No, what he did, he, he actually bore that pain to the place where he was to go. And so we find here in verse 19 that the, uh, the, um, the chief priests and the scribes have condemned Jesus to death, so they hand him over to the Gentiles to mock and scourge him. That means skin him alive. Ah, yeah, you're the, you're the savior. Look here, yeah, you're about to die. Well, they were making fun of him. And they skinned him alive. They poked, him, poked a hole in each side. They put nails in his hands and his feet to hold, strong enough to hold him on that cross. The, the weight of his body pulling down, making it very, very difficult to breathe. And there he was for three hours, suffering for your sins and mine, the sins of the entire world, all a part of God the Father's plan. So after they had mocked him and scourged him and crucified him, guess what? On the third day, he will be raised. And Jesus is talking to disciples about this. They're, they don't understand, but he's trying to get them to understand what this life is really all about. In John 28, verse 8, it says, so the other disciple, this is John at this point in time. John doesn't mention himself, but he's talking about himself. So he says, and, and so the other disciple, John, he said, who first who had first come to the tomb. So John had come to the tomb just like others had. He said, then also entered. John who came to the tomb, then also entered the tomb. I don't know, what, what do you think he was looking for? He's looking for Jesus. And guess what? 
He saw and he believed, not because he saw Jesus, but he Jesus had been talking to this uh, about this to the disciples for three years, off and on about this. They weren't getting it. They weren't getting it. They weren't getting it. And John, the writer of the Gospels, the writer of the epistles, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, he finally gets it, and he gets it when he goes into the tomb and doesn't see Jesus, and that was the reason he believed. Oh, this is what he was talking about. He's gone. He has been resurrected. He tried to tell us this. We couldn't, we couldn't fathom this. No, he's the king. He's here to establish a kingdom. How can he go away? Well, see, they didn't understand. And so John saw and he believed. What he saw was an empty tomb. He didn't see Jesus. Then in verse 9, it says, for as yet they, the disciples, listen to this. See, it, it's very clear here. For as yet, that is up to this point in time. And listen, John's at the, he's at the tomb. John now believes the other disciples that have been traveling with Jesus, they aren't there. They still don't understand. And John's very clear about this in verse 9. For as yet they did not understand the scripture. That's the disciples. They didn't understand the scripture. They didn't understand Jesus. That, and what didn't they understand? That he must rise again from the, from the dead. They were there when he, when he crucified him. Well, it's all over. Guess what they did? They, cru they stood there and watched Jesus be crucified. They watched that three-hour period of time, everything he went through. They saw him bow his head and die after he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Head drops, physically dead. Spirit and soul leave the body. The soul goes into paradise. The, the, uh, the, uh, the spirit goes to be with the father and the, and the body goes to the grave. He must rise again. They didn't understand that. So what are we doing here? In these several verses, what we're seeing is, a, is biblical evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And just like Jesus said to Martha, do you believe this? The question for you, the question for me is, do we believe this? And if we do, there's more to understand. So let's move on from there. Concerning, concerning this resurrection, we need to realize that all three persons of the Godhead had an active role in Christ's resurrection. Now, this, is, this is a, may seem like a very simple point, but the truth of the matter is, is we need to realize that all three persons of the Godhead had an active role in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So what we'll do is we'll explore the scripture and we'll find out about these three persons of the Godhead who had an active role in Christ's resurrection. Now notice here, in the first point we just made about the, the resurrection being biblically, biblically proven, now what we're doing, we were focusing on Jesus then, we're focusing on Jesus here. So we find then in Colossians 2, 2 12, that in fact, God the Father had an active role in Jesus' resurrection. And here's what it says. I'll read the whole verse and then go back and explain it. He said, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were ra also raised up with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. Okay, now watch this. What we're doing is looking for that phrase where it indicates that God the Father had an active role in the, in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So when it says, having been buried with him in baptism, he's Paul is talking to born-again believers in Colossae. He's talking to people that are already saved. And he tells them, as a part of the mystery doctrine of the age of grace, this is information that no one has ever heard prior to the age of grace. Prior to the time that Paul was saved on the road to Damascus and then transformed into a born-again Christian in the, in the Raven Desert, this information cannot be found anywhere in the Old Testament, Genesis to, to Malachi. It cannot be found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You cannot find this in the first eight chapters of uh, the, the book of Acts. And he's explaining this mystery truth to them. He said, having been buried with him in baptism. This is, not a, this is not being buried in a grave. This is what we're talking about here is being identified with Jesus. When the moment we get saved, 
one of the one of the 51 things that happens to us that's provided for us is positional truth so we are in christ jesus now if we are in christ jesus retroactively we're able to go back and find ourselves on the cross with jesus we find him we find ourselves on the cross we find ourselves being buried with him and three days later he was resurrected and 40 days later he ascends into heaven and what is he doing he's seated to the right hand of god the father and because of the baptism of the holy spirit where the holy spirit identifies you with jesus christ at the moment of your salvation you're identified with christ in his death his burial his resurrection his ascension and his station and you are seated in christ in the heavenlies right now undergoing and participating in his in his strategic victory in the angelic conflict and while you're spiritually seated in heaven with him you and i are down here on planet earth right now until we die physically and, and, and or until the rapture of the church occurs and we are expressing the tactical victory in relationship to the strategic victory that Jesus won, we are down here now on planet Earth and we are involved in solving the angelic conflict as a part of the tactical victory of the angelic conflict. And it could not happen if Jesus had not been uh, buried, uh, had not really been crucified, dead, buried, and resurrected. If he had not done that, there would be no hope for you or me. So having been buried with him, Christ, in baptism, that's baptism of the Holy Spirit, by which baptism of the Holy Spirit, you as a born again Christian, whoever you are, you were raised, you were also raised. How were you raised? Well, you're down here on planet Earth. Spiritually, you were, you were with Christ on the cross. You were with him when they, when they buried him. You were with him when he was resurrected. You were with him when he's ascended into heaven. You're with him seated at the right hand of God the Father. So when you are raised up, where are you being raised up to? You're being raised up to be seated with Christ at the right hand of God the Father. So Colossians 2.12 says, having been buried with him, that you, in, bap in baptism, by which baptism of the Holy Spirit, you born again Christians, you were also raised up to seat with, sit with Jesus Christ at the right hand of God the Father. You are raised up with him. That's positional truth, current positional truth. Current positional truth, you're in heaven right now, spiritually seated in Christ Jesus. You're there with him. How did you get there? It was through your faith in what? Your faith in the working of God. That's God the Father. Your faith in the working of God the Father, you believe in Christ. You believe in his death, burial, and resurrection. And as a result of that faith, that's exhale faith, you're, you believe in the working of God, who God the Father raised him, Jesus Christ, from the dead. You see, this verse alone indicates that God the Father had a part in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. How about 1 Thessalonians 1.10? Paul is addressing growing believers. Now, he's not just addressing believers. He is, he is addressing believers that are actually growing toward and into spiritual maturity. And these believers, he said, he said this, to these believers who are growing, he said, and to wait. See, he's already, what he's done in verse 9, he is, he is praising them for the fact that they have believed in Jesus. The message that he gave them they had he's praising them because they have taken the word of god the mystery doctrines that he's preaching and teaching to gentiles they're taking that information and they're actually growing they're advancing to spiritual maturity so he says to them here's what i want you to do you've you've been saved you're you're understanding the word you're growing now here's what you need to do wait 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 well what does that mean wait that says mean oh let's see okay i'll just sit around what i'm gonna do i'll have a meal i'll go to the movies i'll uh, go out and run a mile no no he's talking about waiting here in the sense of anticipation in other words <coughs> you know you know that jesus is coming back you know he's coming back but here's the issue Many Christians want Jesus to come back, and when they want him to come back, not a year from now, not five years from now, not a hundred years from now, not a thousand years, we want you back here right now. Lord, they look up to heaven and say, look, 
Do you not understand what's going on down here? If I were you and saw what was going down here, listen, I, you, I would take me and everybody else out of here so we wouldn't be suffering this kind of pain. Lord, you know what this virus is? Do you see what's happening to us down here? Well, hello. Paul said, I know who you are. I know you're saved. I know you're growing. But what I want you to do is to wait. And that is in the sense of anticipation, anticipating the return of Christ. But I want you to wait there. So, and to wait for his, God the Father, Son, Jesus Christ, wait for, and to wait for his Son from heaven, out of heaven. You're to wait for his Son out of heaven. Where is he right now? He's in heaven. You're supposed to anticipate him coming, but you wait until he gets here. Then he's talking about whom he, God the Father, wow, well, how about that now? Who he, whom he, God the Father, raised from the dead. God the Father has a part to play in the resurrection of Jesus. How do we know? The scripture tells us. That is Jesus raised him from the dead. That is Jesus who rescues us, born again Christians. He is rescuing, rescuing you and me from the wrath to come. Hold it now. This is why when, we, when we're studying the word of God, we must think about what we're getting. This is part of what, what Al and I are, are trying to, uh, to discuss on our Wednesday, on our Wednesday night uh, Bible class, functioning together, talking about, um, uh, talking about the brain, the relationship with the brain to the spirit, et cetera, in our, in our lives. We have to think of these things. Okay, so he's rescuing us from the wrath to come. Well, I, I don't have a problem with that. I know that at the end of human history, all unbelievers are going to, going to hell on the lake of fire. Well, excuse me, just a moment. Is it possible this might mean something else? Yes. See, what happens is there's coming a time in the future when you are going to be rescued from the, from the tribulation. And that is the wrath that comes. The wrath that comes here is the tribulation period. So he says, now that you're saved, now that you're growing, he said, I want you to anticipate his coming back in the air anticipate it, know it's there. But, you know, it's not a matter of hurry up and get here, hurry up and get here. No, we have to be content. He has a plan for our lives until he, until he returns or until we die physically. So we're to wait for his return from heaven, whom God the Father raised from the dead, who rescues you and me from the wrath to come, which is the tribulation, and how are we rescued? We are rescued because he's coming back, giving us a resurrection body, and getting us completely out of here while the tribulation and the great tribulation take place. You and I will be gone. But what does that tell us? What we're seeing here, the second verse that indicates God the Father has a part to play in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Then the book, then the, uh, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20. Now, the God of, the God of peace who brought him up from the dead. Uh oh, hold it now. God the Father has a part to play in the resurrection of Jesus. Now, the God, the God of peace, who is the God of Father, who brought, who brought up from the dead, that's Jesus Christ. Now, watch this. That word dead there is a plural and it says, now God, the God of peace, who brought up from the deaths, plural, he, he brought him, see, he, he died spiritually. For three hours on the cross, he died spiritually. He was separated from God the Father. So that was one death. And after he died spiritually and came back to life spiritually, he had ten less die, it is finished. He is now a spiritual being again in his humanity. And just shortly after that, he on the cross, after he said, Tetelestai, it wasn't long after that, they bowed his head and gave up the ghost. He died physically. So what we see here is both a spiritual and a physical resurrection. Now to, to the God of peace, that's God the Father, who brought up from the dead, who did he raise? He brought him out of spiritual death and physical death raised him out of physical death to give him a resurrection body. And who was that? It was the great shepherd. God the Father brought up from the dead the great shepherd. 
That is Jesus Christ. He's the great shepherd of the sheep. Guess who the sheep are? That's you, that's me, well, family members. So he brought, up from, he brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep, and how did he do it? He said, through the blood. He, he did this through the blood. In other words, this is, this is Christ's death on the, on the cross, and that through the blood there is not his literal blood. You've heard me teach this in the past, and others teaching the same thing. The word blood here is a representative analogy, and it was through his spiritual death paying for the sins of the world that enabled him to pay for the sins of the world, die physically, and then three days later be resurrected. All this came through the blood, the blood of the eternal covenant, and the eternal covenant here is the new covenant, not with Israel in the, in the millennium, but it's the new covenant that God wrote for you and me, even Jesus our Lord. Now, okay, so God the Father has had a part in the resurrection of Jesus. The Holy Spirit also has a part. Romans 8, 11. But if the spirit of him who raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised, raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life. To what? To your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Let's pull that apart. But if the spirit of him who raised up Jesus from the dead, that spirit, but, but if the Holy Spirit of him who raised up Jesus from the dead, that's a first class condition, and he did, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. What kind of life is the spirit of God going to give you? See, Paul is writing to Christians. They don't need spiritual life. What they need is resurrection life. They need, okay, so I'm saved. Well, five years later, 30 years later, 60 years later, I can see now I'm ready to die physically, go to the grave, and life is all over. No, it's not. If the spirit of him, the spirit, see, the spirit of him means Christ said, look, you don't understand now to his disciples. But I'm going to go away, and I'm going to send the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to teach you all these things. So if the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, and he does, he, the Holy Spirit, who raised Jesus from the dead, will also give life to your mortal bodies. What's your mortal body? That's this body that we have right now that is subject to all kinds of frailties. That's our mortal body. So he's also going to give life to your mortal bodies. Well, we need it, Lord. Uh, and so people say, oh, let it come, Lord, let it come. He's going to give life to our mortal bodies. How? Through his spirit who dwells in you. Now watch this. The, whole, the spirit who indwells your human spirit gives you life, spiritual life, when you're functioning in the sphere of the spirit. He's also, he's also the one who raised Jesus from the dead. Well, wait a minute. Dr. Jim, I thought you said God the Father raised him from the dead. See, this is why we're indicating all three persons of the Godhead had a part to play in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So he's going to, he's going to give life to our mortal bodies, meaning that this body of frailties is going to be set aside at death or the rapture, and you're going to get a brand new, brand new, brand new body. That's the resurrection body. And it says through. That word through there is an ablative of means in the Greek. And that means that he the spirit will give you give you life, give life to your frail body by means of the spirit. So the, the Holy Spirit who is living inside you is going to be the one who has a part to play in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He dwells in you. Now, how about 1 Peter 3.18? We're talking about God, the Holy Spirit, having a part to play in the resurrection of Jesus. 1 Peter 3.18 says, for Christ also died. Yes, he did. Now, we've got a lot of thunder going on outside right now. Now, here's what he says. For Christ also died. Well, he died physically, but this is a reference to his spiritual death. First, the spiritual death, when the first sin hit him on the cross, and then died physically three hours later. For Christ also died spiritually. What, what, for what reason? 
for sins, our sins, all of our sins, past, present, and future. Christ died for our sins, that's judicial forgiveness. Once and for all, it will never happen again. So when you meet Jesus at the Bema seat, you're not going to be asked about your sins. You're going to be asked about the good deeds that you did, whether or not you were functioning in the sphere of the spirit when you were carrying out your ambassadorship, or whether you were functioning in the sphere of the flesh. So Christ died for the sins, for sins, once and for all. The just, that, that word just means righteous. The righteous one. And who was that? Jesus, who died once for sin, the righteous one. The righteous one died physically for, spiritually and physically, for the unjust. That's unbelievers. So Jesus, who is righteous, just, died for the unbelievers, you and me, when we're, when we're not saved, the unrighteous people. Why did he do that? So that he, Jesus, might bring us to God the Father. Why? God the Father is the author of the plan. Jesus is going to take us to the Father because he has the, he has the responsibility of executing the plan. So having been put to death in the flesh, Jesus was put to death in the flesh. In his flesh, he died spiritually. He died while in his physical body. But it says, but he was made alive. Oh, so he died. He died a spiritual death. He, he later died a physical death, but now he is made alive. What does that mean? He was resurrected in the Holy Spirit? No, not in the Holy Spirit. That's the instrumental use of that word uh, preposition. It means but made alive by the Spirit, which is the Holy Spirit. So God the Father has a part to play in the resurrection of Christ. God the, God the Spirit has a, a part in the resurrection of Christ. Well, isn't it amazing? Jesus Christ also had a part in his resurrection. John, verse, uh, John chapter 10, verse 17 and 18. He said, for this reason. Now, what reason is he talking about? See, and this is why, this is why I think it's so important that when we're teaching the word of God, that we need to expand the, expand the verse and that's called it, we're calling this exposition. We're explaining the verse. And that's why that bracketed information for this reason. Well, I don't know, well, just a second. All I got here is the fact that you wrote something here about a reason. What reason are we talking about? Well, the reason he's talking about is because of the prophecy in verse 16, the preceding verse. I'm going to share something with you. So because of the prophecy in verse 16, he said, the father, that's God, the father loves me. Because of the prophecy in verse 16, God the Father loves me. God the Father loves the Son. Why does he love him? He said, because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. Wait a minute. Just a second. What's he referring to? Back in eternity past, before anything was ever created, all you have is the, all you have is the, uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and God the Father already has a plan. So he executes that plan through Jesus when Jesus created, and this is this is after he created the angels. Then you have it, then you have an angelic conflict between God the Father and Satan. Satan wants to take over. Lucifer, son of the morning, says, Look at me, I'm so beautiful and I'm so intelligent. Nothing, there's nothing like me on the planet. By the way, I, I'm I'm tired of this responsibility I have. I think I'm just going to take over. So we have the five I wills of satan going to take over for this reason now back in eternity past after all this taken place a part of god the father's plan from eternity past before anything else was ever created including including the angels god the father had this plan where when when satan fell and adam and eve fell the issue is son here's what i want you to do we got these two people down here. They've fallen. They, they were righteous. They're fallen. They were down there to resolve the angelic conflict. They failed. I'm going to create some more people. I'm not going to create them. I'm going to allow more, more human beings to be born into life. But here's the issue. There has to be a payment for, uh, for the sins of humanity. So I'm going to ask you, second person of Godhead, I'm asking you to go down to planet Earth, become a human being, and born of a virgin, and I want you to live live X number of years in, in perfect righteousness, and I want you to go to the cross, 
and be crucified for the sins of the world, paying for the sins of the world. I'm going to let you die, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to raise you from the dead after you've died. Then you're going to come to heaven. You're going to sit at my right hand. You're going to have the authority to leave that throne sometime down there in the future. Uh, you see when, you, you're on this, you know when. And you're going to come down here and you're going to get the body of Christ out of the age of grace. You're going to bring them up here and get them all cleaned up. And while that tribulation is going on down there on planet Earth, we're going to be getting ready to send you back down to planet Earth for the righteous reign within the kingdom that I actually promised the Jews. And you're going to go down there and you're going to reign on planet Earth for a thousand years. Perfect environment. We're going to resolve this angelic conflict at the end of that 1,000 years. And guess what? We're going to send all the unbelievers and all the fallen angels. They're all going to the lake of fire. They're out of here. And we're going to have a new heaven, a new earth. And, and we're, going to, we're going to have a, 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 just a magnificent eternity future. Nothing but righteousness and peace and joy and comfort and fellowship with one another, all those that are in heaven. So in verse 17, for this reason, the Father loves me. What's the reason? I have committed myself to his plan. I'm going to do it. So the Father loves him because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. I'm going to lay down my life. And he told me that three days later, I'm going to have a resurrection body. Now that is in his humanity. Then he says, no one has taken it. So when you're looking at Jesus on that cross and you see that you see the chief priests and the scribes who say guilty, guilty, guilty. And you're going to die. The, the punishment is the, the punishment is death. Hey, Gentiles, come over here and get this guy. And so they turn him over to the Gentiles. And they take him out and they scourge him and they beat him and they mock him. They put him on the cross. They nail his hands and his feet to the cross. Pain, suffering, skin him alive. And he says, he said, no one takes my physical life from me. Look, the, the, so the scribes and the Pharisees, they did it. No, no, it was the Gentiles that did it. No, no, no. No, they didn't do that. No, he said, no one has taken my physical life away from me. I lay it down on my own initiative. Jesus was not helpless on the cross. He was not a helpless victim. He was paying for your sins and good grief. He was paying for your sins and mine. The sins of the entire world. Every, every rotten, stinking, dirty thing I've ever thought, said, did, or felt. He paid for it in three hours. And he says, no one has taken my physical life away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. And he goes on to say, he said, I have authority. And he has authority from two sources. He said, I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to lay down my life. This is not something that somebody's making me do. He said, I have authority. And what is the, what is the authority that Jesus has to, go, to come down here on this planet Earth to live in this vile, in this vile human, whatever we want to call it, and live for 33 years, go to the cross, die for the sins of the world, and go through all of that, that pain and suffering on your, on your behalf and my behalf. He was our substitute. Every one of us should be on that cross personally. There should be a cross for every human being on the planet. Every human being. That's you. That's me. That's we. That's us. So he went there on his own initiative. Why? He, wanted, he was a part of the angelic conflict resolution. So he said, yes, I will be a part of this, Father. And he said, look, no one takes my life away from me. I did this on my own initiative. I have the authority to lay it down. I have the authority to lay it down. And what is his authority? Authority. His authority comes from two sources. The first source is from the plan of God. It was God the Father's plan from eternity past that Jesus Christ did this. Jesus bought into the plan. So he has the, why well, that doesn't make any sense. He must be a fool to do something like that. No, he had the authority to do it. It was the plan of God. 
in etern from eternity past. And he also had the plan. He says, excuse me, you want me to do what? Not on your life. Why don't you go down there and do it? No, he did this of his own volition from two sources. The plan of God gave him the authority to do it. His own volition gave him the authority to do it. He has the authority to lay down his life. And he said, I have authority to take it up again. And that's a reference to his resurrection. This commandment, what's the commandment? The commandment is a, refer a reference to God the Father's plan for Jesus. Jesus says, here it is. Go do it, son. And he said, this commandment, I receive. Where did you get that thought? What, what, you're going to do what? Why are you going to do this? Where did you get that foolish idea? He says, this commandment I receive from my father. That's the author of the plan for all of everything. Okay. Now, so we see that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Oh, goodness gracious. Four minutes. Well, let's look here. We're going to stop here. You have the notes. You read through the remainder of the notes. And you see what, what, the, what these notes are teaching you. Christ's resurrection is necessary for the advance of God the Father's plan. If Jesus had not died on the cross, his God the Father's plan would not be advanced. And guess what? The angelic conflict is over and God the Father loses. And guess what? You and I lose. But Christ's resurrection is necessary for the advance of God the Father's plan. And here's what Isaiah says. Isaiah 53, 10 says, but the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would, if he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. What is he talking about here? Isaiah is prophesying what is going to take place at a time in the future. He said, but the Lord, this is God the Father. What's God Father going to do? But the, but the Lord, God the Father, was pleased to crush him. Crush who? Crush Jesus Christ. That word crush means, and it refers to the sufferings of Christ. God the Father, was, he, was, he was pleased to allow his, his son to suffer. This says he was pleased to do this. Well, hang on. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, to allow him to suffer. Putting him, Jesus, his, the, the Father's plan is going to put him to grief. The Father's plan is going to cause Jesus Christ grief. There's a semicolon there. Then he said, if he, Jesus Christ, would render himself as a guilt offering. And he is. He will. He did that. So when, the, when Jesus was, said, I'll do that, the Father was pleased to see his son suffer, putting him to grief, causing him to suffer on the cross. If he, Jesus, would render himself as a guilt offering, what are you going to do, Jesus? Father, I'm going down there, and I am going to offer myself as a guilt offering. I'm not guilty, but the, but the human race is. And I'm going to offer myself as an offering, a payment for their sins. He, Jesus, if he does this, if he comes down there, it says, he, Jesus, will see his offspring. Who are the offspring? If Jesus comes down and dies for the sins of the world, it's not all over for him. He will receive a resurrection body. And guess what? After he is resurrected, he will see his offspring. That's Christ's spirit, spiritual children. That's you, that's me, that's all believers. And as a result of that, he then, God the Father, will prolong his days. If he goes down and offers himself on the cross, God the Father has an extension of his plan. It doesn't end for you. I will prolong your days. That's Christ's resurrection in the millennium and eternity future. It's not all over for you, son. You will still have life forever with me. And it says, and the good pleasure of the Lord, and the good pleasure here is a reference to God the Father's plan. It pleased the Lord. It was his plan that this would happen. So what happens? The good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in Christ's hand. What does that mean? It means that, that when Jesus chose to do this, the, the government and the direction, I mean, that, that's the governance, okay? That is God, Jesus Christ governing everything that's taking place here. So because he did this, the good pleasure of the Lord, God the Father, 
will prosper in Christ's hands. Means it will prosper under God, under Jesus Christ governing and under his direction. So that phrase will prosper. What does it mean? The resurrection of Christ establishes two types of prosperity. First of all, it's going to establish two types of prosperity that, re, that actually has an impact on you and me. First of all, it's the deliverance of the Gentiles from their miserable straight, st state, the deliverance of the Gentiles from their miserable state of ignorance and idolatry, and secondly, the deliverance of mankind from the captivity of sin and death. The good pleasure of the Lord, God the Father's plan, will prosper in Christ's hand. Now, we're done here. So uh, the re we, we've got some more information here. I'll decide between now and tomorrow night whether or not I'm going to go in and, and finish this and then go on with Ephesians or not. But you have the notes. You can read them, study them, pray over them, ask God to give you insight about this. But what we're learning today is the resurrection of Christ was not just about him. The resurrection of Christ was given, given as a plan of God the Father for the entire human race in the angelic conflict. But that resurrection of Christ has impact on your life and mine. And we'll take a look at that, okay? So, Father, thank you this, this morning for the privilege of looking at your word, <coughs> trying to understand what this Easter Sunday is all about. And yes, it is a, it's a national holiday. I understand that. But we need to make sure that there's more to this Easter holiday, this, this particular day, more to that than just evangelizing the lost. Yes, evangelize them at the opportunities there. But as pastor teachers, it is our responsibility to, evan to teach the word of God to born again Christians, not evangelize the saved because there are no unbelievers in the building. So thank you, Father, for this time tonight, and look forward to more night in Christ's name. Amen. God bless all of you. Listen, thank you. Thank you for bearing with me on the front end. Have no idea what happened. It was working at 730, but by the time we got ready, it happened, okay? But thank you for your patience, and I'll see you tomorrow night. God bless you all.